there folks and welcome or welcome back to Nippon Trading International's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host Ziv Nakajima again and this podcast is brought to you among others by Emil Gorgis of realestate.jp. He's a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families who are looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian, he's been living here in Japan for over two decades now, and for about half of that time he's been buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in Tokyo on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So he's got dedicated loan officers in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts Panel Sessions which means that you're already aware of the fact that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area, and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, Drop him a line on sales at realestate.jp. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so for today's episode, uh, this was meant to be a normal JREP session with Emil, Tracy, and myself in attendance, but Emil was late, so Tracy and I got to talking with the recording function uh, running, of course, and so we talk about Tracy's origin story, if you will, um, how she got the idea for Tokyo Family Stays by catering to visiting friends and family members, which eventually ended up with her running operations and consulting on a bunch of short-term rental properties. And that in turn, of course, got us talking about how to profitably and efficiently run that kind of business, the uh, importance of market research and knowing what your offerings are. And then we went a bit meta and started talking values and belief systems in business, how to attract the right kind of client, um, what it's like working with your spouse. um, And that one's a real deep (laughs) rabbit hole to go down into. uh, So that by the time Emil finally joined us, we were talking even deeper topics. So family, happiness in life and in business, um, honesty, transparency, walking your talk and a whole lot of other um, stuff. So yeah, not an entirely Japan real estate related episode this time around, a bit more woo woo. But nevertheless, I hope you enjoy the conversation and I'll see you again on the other side. Okay, slightly reduced Japan Real Estate Experts panel today, at least for now. Emil will be joining us, but we got um, Tracy. Do you want to introduce hey. yourself? Sure, Deb. I am Tracy. I am the short term rental Minpaku expert. I've been hosting uh, short term rentals in Japan for 10 years. Um, I also help people maximize their profitability for short-term rentals all over the world so uh, I don't just uh, talk the talk I walk the walk so that's what I do we were just talking about that you said you had a nice uh, catchphrase what was it well you pay me three hundred dollars and I'll help you make a thousand dollars a month extra yeah yep. yeah so that's, that's what I good, you know uh, that, so you can pick my brain for an hour part. Yeah, and I'll 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 help you you know squeeze that extra money out. You know, for people with like massive portfolios, you know, they've got 50, 60 properties, um, it's really hard to do it. But if you've got like three, four, five properties and you're finding an extra, you know, a thousand dollars a month in each of them, because you put, you know, because you sort of can squeeze little bits of pieces of your of your business, there's level, mm. there's levers to pull and knobs to twiddle. Um, and you know, that, that really adds up. So, but you've got to be committed. It's not passive income, um, as short-term rental hosts. It's a, it's a, it's a hospitality business. It's not really a a real estate. It's not really a real estate business. Mm. Mm. But the, um, that's a good point, actually. Do the, um, I'll introduce myself later. Do people actually, people that you've serviced that have these assets do they also gain on equity when they resell or refinance like i'm assuming especially out of japan properties do actually gain in value right um i look i don't i i don't do the deep dive into the tax code and the you know and how to look at the cash on cash and the uh, the, those sorts of rois that those an acronyms just like are lost on me um i really just look at the monthly p l's and the things like the monthly uh, sort of the the comparison prices of what else is on the market nearby, and you know where you can 
twiddle this dial up and 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 increase your rates or you know squeeze additional income through a through a, a, a different um uh, income stream or add an income stream, add some affiliate work. That's how I tend to work. I'm not really very good at understanding how, um, you know, how to leverage mortgages and different tax codes and that sort of stuff. I'm, that's That frightens me a little bit. I like listening the, to it and the people who do it sound really, really clever. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking the same about you. When you say those extra income streams, you're referring to supplementary services that you provide to guests, right? Absolutely. So, um, you know, just this week, um, I arranged a, an airport pickup uh, from, from, the, from the airport. Um, I arranged, you know, I arranged babysitting, I arrange, um, you know, additional services, translation services. So, you know, with my particular business, I know what my guests need, um, where they're going to be spending their money anyway. So I just provide a solution so that they spend money with me and I either provide the service um, and keep all the money or I outsource that and have a commission system so that uh, someone else does the delivery of the service, but will give me an introduction fee. And they've got the advantage that they, A, they can book everything, all of these services in English with you, and B, that there's somebody actually taking care. You're basically like their uh, concierge, I guess, Perfect. right? Like yeah. you're actually, you're yeah. making sure it all happens on time and when they need it. Yeah. And also, I've, like, you know, I don't just sort of pick random names. These are These are all businesses that I know, that I've, that I know will deliver the level of service that you know that is good value um yeah. it's not sort of just some random website that someone's found it's like well no these are these are companies that i know i know that you know i'm pretty careful about who i work with as well like i'm very uh, i don't know i want to stick with my values so um you know if it's a small business if it's a woman-led business i'm all about that um i'm all about small businesses as well um, and, you know, because that's what my, that's what really resonates with my guests as well. They want to see that their money is going to, um, you know, to a small business. Um, there's just too many big, faceless, nameless corporations grabbing our money. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're going to see more and more artisan type or uh, artisan type businesses that flourish because people want to go back to more of that high touch, you know, high service, um, you know, feelsies, the feelsies. And, and the, uh, the value system, that's another good point you bring up. Like I used to be all kind of neutral and faceless and not state my views and my values on communication because we, we do get all sorts. We, you know, we sometimes get, um, like, especially if you're dealing with places like uh, Singapore, for example, a lot of people there are Christians, right? So you get a lot of people, you look at their LinkedIn profile, like big bankers, and they're, they're all about Christian values in their profile. And I used to think that, you know, if I get in there with my values, which can be quite in opposite, <laughs> like quite opposite to those on many cases, um, or at least to the things that they believe are, are opposed to them, um, I would not get that business. But um, I've, I've, stop doing that i feel a lot more comfortable just putting myself out there and you know i get excited if we have um um single females like in your case or if we have uh, lgbtq customers that like i get excited about that kind of th stuff yeah. you know so no, I'm, I do too. Mm. I'm not i'm not shy putting it out there anymore and you know if it doesn't gel with someone then they're probably not the right customer for us anyway Exactly. And that's that's having the mindset of like, well, there's enough business out there, whatever your business is. And I know this is getting a little woo woo, but, you know, whatever your business is, there is enough there for you to not have to just chase the dollar, but but chase the, the deal and and sleep well at night, knowing that you've actually done a good job. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I guess the older I get, the the more that I want to feel that I'm actually you know, making a, making a difference in the world. I don't want to sound hokey or, you know. No, but promoting the things okay, that you but, stand for, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And like, I, like I, you know, I'm a blogger and I think you saw my blog post just recently on how you can, you know, have your values be seen in, in your business, right? So um, how to show that your Mimpaku property is LGBTQ friendly. Um, uh, you know, even if you're, even if you're you know, you're not one of the letters, right? You can still be an ally. Um, and I, I'm very strong in my allyship um, 
of, uh, you know, the LGBTQ community. And so, you know, I, I make it very clear in my properties that I look after families and families look all different shapes and colors. But yeah. if, you're fa- if you're a family, then whatever, you know, however you, <laughs> however you present, um, yeah. I will, I will be able to take care of you because families have a, have a rhythm to them. Um, and, you know, it's not just that it's mum and dad and kids or whatever, but, but the family, the way families travel has a certain rhythm and, and a cadence to it that I understand. And then I can, that I can meet their needs, which and is that's diff- regardless of composition of the family, actually, isn't exactly, it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is different from when you've got, you know, groups of friends traveling together or yeah. you know, groups of colleagues traveling together. So, um, yeah. so, you know, I can look after lots of different people, but my specialty is always going to be families. Um and so, you know, I'm very, I'm very clear about that in the name of my company, um, in, you know, in the values that we, you know, set out in the way that we've decorated. Um, it's, it's all really geared at, at towards that ideal client. And there's enough business out there. So, um, you know, I, I think when I was very clear about who I was targeting, not thinking that I had to serve everybody, that I was really narrowing the focus. That's really where my business took off because I was able to charge the right amount of money so that my business was successful um, yeah. and not feel like I had to discount to to buy in customers. Um, so yeah. I valued what I was doing. My customers valued what I was doing. And so price doesn't really come into it so much. Mm. Mm. It's um, There's also... Like in our in our case, I think there's an added layer of complexity there because there's two of us kind of helming the boat, and um, our values are very similar in many 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 aspects. But we each have our own focus. I guess more of a personality than a. It's not a clash, but like for example, Chicago would always prioritize um, property deals where we can help um, restore and preserve older traditional Japanese home. Right, like she's mm-hmm. really really into that. And that sometimes translates into, hang on, that person that you're serving now, they just want to tear that place down and they want to build a little apartment building there and they're going to cater to students or, you know, do we really want to do that deal? And I'm like, well, yeah, but we want to help him too, right? Like the fact that he's in it for the money doesn't mean that he's a bad guy. So there's there's all these little complex conversations inside the daily operations that come into play as well. Same in my household too, because I work with I work with the husband as well, and he uh, <laughs> it can be a challenge sometimes. Yeah, yeah, mm. <laughs> on all sorts of different levels, isn't it? Yes, yes. yeah. Um, but he, you know, during the pandemic, he started up his own business, and it's it's he's killing it now. So hopefully- I thought that was always his thing. I didn't realize that you guys were doing uh, the meme packet together. No, no, we were we. So um, some backstory. Yeah, I started you know, 10 or so years ago, it was just me. Um, and cause I was always sort of into real estate. I was doing a bit of subletting. Shh. I was doing a bit of subletting yeah. of, 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 um, of places for people. Sometimes the landlord is all for that, by the way. Well, sometimes, but I, there's, sometimes <laughs> there's not, <laughs> um, yeah. this is, this is a long time ago. Um, and it was, you know, some people who, were coming in and out. They didn't have the visa, and they wanted a they wanted a place. And so this is well before Airbnb came around. It wasn't even that heavily regulated at that point in time. Uh, I remember pre two thousand eighteen, it was pretty much the wild west. Uh, the Min Paku market, right? yeah, pretty much. Um, and so then I then uh, I got my own place in my own second house in my own name near my house, and uh, you know our our son was really young. We were getting lots of visitors. And so it was time for, you know, and it was, there were lots of visitors coming in to come and see the baby. So I was like, we can't, you know, you can't sleep on our floor. So I got got the second apartment and um, set it up with my in-laws and with my parents in mind. Um, And then thought, well, if I can just do it 50% of the time, I've broken even. Uh, It wasn't. This is so like, I, I, not to cut you off, but this is exactly what we went through with, um, my mom and my stepmom, they both come here as often as they can, which, you know, recently is not that much because of COVID, but they used yep. to come for about a month and a half, two months each yep. at, mm-hmm. at a pop. And like, I love having you guys here, but in my living room for two, two months, twice a year is just not going to happen. <laughs> like, it's not, 
we exactly. had to get them an apartment. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly that's exactly my story as well. And when we built the house that I'm in now, we actually built the studio apartment exactly for that reason. So yeah. my ideal guest in my studio apartment is actually the in-laws. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, and their needs. So how it, how I've set that up is based on their needs. So. Yeah, it was just by accident that I got into it um, and it just took off. It just went bonkers and there was not enough space even for when the in-laws came. So I got another apartment and another apartment and another apartment. Um, so I've been doing this uh, for a little while. Uh, and then and Rich, Ashley was with you from the get-go until just well, recently. No, he was. I was just doing it on my own. Um, okay. And my brother was one of the investors, actually. So he was, so he was the one that put up some of the cash for the second, third, and fourth. Um, and I was still doing it on my own. Ashley was working in restaurants at that point. Um, he was a restaurant manager. Um, and at Le Cordon Bleu, you know, the the, the French cooking school? Yeah. Um, and uh, and then it was like, well, the hours are rubbish. Um, you know, you, we're not spending that much time together as a family. If I get a couple more houses, why don't you come and join the business? So, and uh, so that's what he did. Um, and he joined the business, I think it was two years in. Um, and then, uh, yeah, he was working all the way through until the pandemic. And then, um, he's then started up his own business, but he wants to come back. I don't know that I want him to come back <laughs> <laughs> because we have different, he's, he's, we have kind of different approaches. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the feeling very well. Yeah, yeah, we have kind of different approaches. So Emil's just coming in now. Um, yeah, we have different approaches, the way that we approach um, guests and um, the way we do check-ins as well. Because I do that, you know, I'm very, I'm very like welcoming and, you know, hey, why don't you relax? And here's this and here's that. And he wants to be very like, trash is here this is this time this is you know don't do this don't do that blah 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 yeah. oh, there'll be trouble and i'm like going <laughs> oh hang on this is not well so, some guests might need that though right like, you can probably tell when you talk when you have yeah, the first yeah. chat with them you've got to read the room though man yeah. like you've got to read the room um and figure out all right well where's the potential you know after twelve thousand guests you sort of figure out well, you know, here's my the friction point. Here's yeah. my possible, here's where yeah. I could possibly fall. And, and you just sort of, you just keep your eye on various people. I've had very few actual true Muppets, very few true numpties. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, but we've set everything up so that, so that they're very well, they're very well educated. They're very well contained. Um, uh, they know what the, the, the rules are. Um, and, you know, uh, I can still keep my eye on people without like them feeling that I'm being a school mom. So yeah, yeah. you are a school mom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, if that's still a thing, or if you just need somewhere quiet to get away from the world. They offer a variety of options for families, corporate relocations, or even if you're simply transitioning between homes in Tokyo. The properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They come with fast unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in. Fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but longer term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly in a Japanese business hotel. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home, with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, etc. You definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profit, 
or a holiday home that you want to rent out when you're not using it via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth a visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at sales at realestate.jp. And now back to the podcast. So Emil, today, uh, because you are not here and it was just Tracy, it kind of turned into an interview with Tracy Northcott. So we're talking about her life's work. I'm going to go back and watch this one. I usually don't, <laughs> don't want to. I don't think I've ever listened to the podcast or watched the videos because. I don't know. I cringe at myself. Um, but I did this well, well, we were talking about, and... um, actually, it'd be good to look you in. We were talking about values and also about different approaches. Um, like, for example, um, you know, catering to specific types of uh, people that actually fit your, your um, belief system, I guess. But you're very, mm -hmm. Emil's very clear about who he's, who he can help the best. And he's, yep. uh, that's sort of baked right into his business. So, um, and that's that's knowing that there's going to be, you know, you don't have to chase all the business. There's enough in that demographic that that will that will create a business that's sustainable for you, right? And comfortable for you to work in, right? Doing the things that you love. That's circling back to that again. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Like so, for, for me as well. Like, you know, growing up an immigrant, where you know. Finan always sort of financial hardship and financial struggle. Um, but we had a strong, close-knit family and a lovely, you know, uh, you know, with my siblings, with my cousins, my extended family. You know, mommy's one of 10, dad's one of seven. So You're got, Middle Eastern and, origins. I know that type of family well. <laughs> exactly, right? So I've got over like 50 first cousins. So my, my it's, it's huge, right? And the home was always... An open space for us um like for my dad always like you know guests come to our house um because that's where everything happens that's where the community is is built and the long-term relationships are built and that that's happiness and that's joy um and that's why you know uh, tracy you've been to my christmas party right um it's 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 absurd um it's just okay it's open house for anyone to sort of just come and and enjoy it and it's quite joyful and it's just fun and there's no no strings attached Right, you just come and enjoy and eat. And I, so for me, having a home, a place to be able to raise your family and build your community and families for, for long term happiness and also for, fin for family stability because financial security, you know, growing up an immigrant without financial security, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of scary. Then when you finally do have it, it's such a relief. Um, that you can enjoy life more, enjoy the family more, and your friends more, and I, and so that's why people with my people with my. Oh, hold on, I'm speaking of yeah, because they're where are you? Where are you? Hi. Uh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's part of the background. Where yeah, the three are. That's one of them. Hey, okay. Hey, hey, hey. He's trying to cut one of his, uh, get eat one of his uh, uh, Halloween candy. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. put it in your eyeball. Oh yeah, happy Halloween! Totally forgot. Happy Halloween that. for the other day. Yeah, you get up to anything yeah, exciting? Yeah. He can't hear you. Oh, uh, 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 he can't <laughs> bite it. Well, I have, I'm on the phone right now. So uh, no, get not right now. I'm on the phone. You go, I'm on the phone. I told you. Get the scissors. I told you. I'm not going to open it now. Hey, take the scissors. <laughs> but it's, Just, it's I Wonderful. It is. It is really nice to actually around, yeah. have a business that sustains you, but also feeds your soul as well. Again, without, I guess, for so many years, I was like, you know, in my twenties and thirties, I was trying to be this like really cool business person, you know. All the, but the the older I get, the more in touch with. Um, you know, heart-centered businesses, knowing that they can be profitable, that you can build something that is that that brings you joy, um, and it doesn't have to be soulless, and you don't have to be ripping people off. You're um, and you you're also building wealth for your own family. I think you can have it all like that. And the and people that don't believe that, I just don't tend to hang around with. And I think our group here, I think we all share those values as well. We just have tended to, you know, you tend to find your tend to find your tribe or, you know, got to be careful saying that, but you got to, you do find you the, the people who do share those sort of business values as well. 
Mm. Yeah, there's maturity involved too, both from a personal perspective and the business perspective. Like for the first few years, when you're struggling to just, you know, get the business off the ground, you also can't be that picky about, I'm only going to work with the customers who fit my values and that I'm comfortable with. But as the business grows and you grow, it becomes a lot more feasible to do that. Right? Well, you don't know what your values are. And then, you know, you that, have that's various, a part of it, too. Yeah. You, you know, and also you have various mentors and you, I guess you know, the various people that are around you, 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 if you listen to your gut and realize, well, you know, that person, you know, they might be really wealthy, but I don't really, I don't really gel with their, you know, yeah. their values in life. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it is a process of elimination um, of uh, and attraction of, of getting to a point where, you know, I sleep well for me anyway, I sleep well at night um, and I've got, you know, I've built a house in a, in, in a, in the one of the most well traditionally one of the most expensive real estate places in the world so mm. you know i feel yeah. very fortunate mm. yeah uh, we have, like so on that about values like it's hard i think sometimes hard to grasp the idea of people that don't some people may not have similar values to you but i think oh, hold on i've got to i've got to help my son open this it's like yeah <laughs> this is this is well, you're this, uh, the is several, but you're um, no, no, so, level right yeah. Well, even if people don't really match my values, like it, it's hard when it's just, it's, it's sometimes just, it's a transaction. And so val- almost values aren't so important. Like I get, you know, some people, they want to invest or they're just looking to buy a place, whatever. And they're not, maybe they're, it's not such a significant thing for them in their life. That's still fine. Yeah. Right. So I've got to cut this eyeball out for myself. <laughs> um, but, but the ones the, that you remember, the ones that you remember, the ones that you you know, like this is why I do the job that I do. When you get those, that really re- like reinforces those things, right? Yes. It doesn't have to be yeah, every but, single time, yeah. Yeah, mm. but but on the flip side, on the flip side, so I've got a, a good story of when someone who was extremely like I did not gel, here you go, did not gel with my values at all, like to the like, like in sort of like it left me with a bad taste in my mouth. Like no, this way, this way, this way. <laughs> Yeah, little ghost child. You're a ghost. Okay. Ah, I think get out again. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, someone without who didn't Joel was another uh, real estate broker, and he um, approached me and said, "Look, we do. He wants to introduce to my clients full building, like sale or full investment buildings. And what they do is they find investment buildings. This is maybe uh, three years ago. Like it's pre-COVID, maybe a year before COVID." So, you know, four years ago or so. And because what they do is they find full buildings and they, let's say it's, you know, a hundred million yen, like a million dollars, a hundred million yen. They'll find it and they'll um, buy it for, or they'll agree to buy it for like 90 million yen. Yeah. Okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and then they'll pitch it to a seller. Uh, so pitch it to a buyer and say, look, we've got this full, full apartment building um, and it's a hundred million yen. Um, and it's a good deal, etc. So they do the transaction and on the same, on the for, same day. Yeah, yeah, it's just done. Yeah, yeah it's, it's called it, a short it sale. I think it's it's yeah. very yeah. common in the states. Yeah, it, yeah, precisely. And and it, yeah. it happens, but what? And it, it's fine. Like if I buy something and I sell it at a higher price, that that's fine. But what they do is like they, you know, it's one of those. I don't remember the name of the company, but there were quite a few popping up in those, you know, five years ago or so where. They really target foreigners and they try to sell entire buildings, right? I know and say, the company well, we, you mean. Yeah. Uh, I know there's actually quite a few of them and they're similar, right? Um, and they do, often do with Suruga Bank. Suruga Bank, Ryuginko. yeah. And they, but they're doing yeah. it on the same day to avoid the uh, the stamp duties, right? Oh, yeah. So it actually, it never goes into that per individual's name. It skips right. it, yeah. right? But and that's 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 fine. There's actually a process for that. And in real estate, for, for owner change properties, like that, that's fine. But what really got to me was, you know, if someone's, if I do that, I said, look, I found a property cheap and I can resell it for, you know, uh, another 10 million yen of profit. And I do that. I think that's fine. What really did not fit with my values was these people are pitching how this is a great investment and how it's worth a hundred million yen. And it's actually worth more that hundred million yen is a good deal. And the idea is that this is to build financial wealth. They're like financial planners or financial advisors for the individual. And then they're also charging the 3% agency fee on the transaction. So we'll advise you to go with our agency and take so, the yeah. asset that our yeah, agency so, gets a commission for. Yeah, so we get a commission for the sale. 
Plus, on the back, literally, I'm also getting a, 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 a um, I've marked it up 10%, which yeah. on, is, is 100 grand on top of that. And that is, you know. And there's not when, any when, more capital gain to be had because it's already maxed out. It's yeah, maxed out exactly. at the top of the market, right? It's not going to, mm. it's not going to grow in value anymore because it's Japan property, right? Mm. Yeah, but pre- precisely, right? So you're, you're really, like, but they're, they're trying to pitch it as this is a good financial investment and they're sitting down as though they're like your financial advisor and your financial strategist. And, but it's not a, they're not acting as a, like, you know, as a fiduciary. Yeah, and they're they have, dealing. they're double dealing, yeah. They're double, yeah. And but it's, so it's at the pure detriment to the client. We were talking about right? that earlier too, is like, stay in your lane like you're not a financial advisor you're a real estate company you're doing a short sale you're making a profit it's great but don't pass it off as life-changing advice from a trusted financial advisor right that's what really got me when they're pitching themselves as a trusted financial planner and like okay yeah no these guys have their best interests at heart no like they have they have they have have, have, have my best interest they don't they like if you look when i sell a property i sell and I'm very, we make the three percent commission. That's our cut. That's what we're making for this. But it's clear. <laughs> it's clear, and and that's but the numbers in terms of the loan, the mortgage. Like this is a good deal. And the reason I got into this was because I was pitching it even before I was an agent. I was telling my friends, this is such a great opportunity. Loans like it's you should own your own home in Japan. It makes complete sense. It's how you build financial wealth and financial freedom, um, and wealth for your family is because. Paying rent is, is lost completely. Interest rates are so low. Buy a place. And so it's genuine, but I can't, I, 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 like, I spoke with this guy. I was like, that's just, that's terrible. Like, I can't tell someone this is a good deal. This is how your family is going to get wealth. What would I know? I'm taking the 3%, which you know about, but then an extra, you know, 10%, which you don't know about directly from you, because that's entirely your value. Yeah, the, right, like, the lack of transparency is pretty shady. Mm. Well, yeah, and the, yeah, and, and presenting it as though it's financial advice. Mm. No, um, I get it. I get it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't. Yeah, so that 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 didn't jolt my values at all. I was like, I, I left that with our, the boss of our agency after that sort of interaction. I go, I'm I'm not introducing him to any of my clients. Like my clients, like they they come to my Christmas party. I get when you start going doing so many houses with you know a family and, and their children and they drive in the car from house to house to house for one two three months you're doing this you get to know them, you get to, to know them quite well and so yeah you know, hey i've got a christmas party come you know uh tracy when you came to my christmas party probably i think quite a handful of them had bought houses from me as well um the, the people that were there and i can't have them come to my home and i know yeah, in my mind gonna, that I'm i've gonna, stolen yeah I've, I've taken yeah like that's not that's not the happiness and joy I want on yeah. Christmas. Mm. Yeah. Um, no, so, yeah, so that's exactly my take on right. the value, the clash of values. Um, but when we, you know, I think, yeah, when we just, um, yeah, as we get older, we present our values and just the people that don't align, well, there's less of them and there's more mm. circulation of people that do align mm-hmm. and their yeah, friends absolutely. and their, their references, mm. yeah. So. Yeah. And look in my look in my business as well. Like I, the, the people that sustain my business are that are the guests that come back again and again because they, you know, I've been very clear on the transaction beforehand. This is my house, right? You'll get this, this, and this, and this. When you open the door, it's what you see on the on internet is what I'm selling. So I, I've been very transparent about what's inside. I'm not pretending it's some luxury apartment when it's a it's a family home and that's what I'm selling. And those and that's that's what they're buying though. So and um because I see I see the lifetime value of that customer, you know, I you know, I don't just look at the the how much I can squeeze out of that like what today. I look at how much that that customer is going to be worth to me over time. Um and still make it very and still make it a, a profitable business. It is possible to have both. Um and you know just I had these guests who were in this week, um, a wonderful, a wonderful family, like a, a blended family, two mums, four kids. And, um, you know, uh, and, you know, I was able to provide them a safe 
place where they could be a family in the in in Tokyo you know no sort of funny looks no raised eyebrows that they were a same-sex couple and that really and I and I said to them you your your family is one of the reasons that I do this I provide you a a safe place to enjoy Tokyo and I give you all the tools to enjoy that um you've gone away happy you'll come back again next year so we're we're all one really Mm. and they you know and and I didn't need to discount to do that so I, I love doing that. Like, I mean, in our perspective, there's not so much personal touch, like when you're actually welcoming a guest into a house, but um, just to show them the understanding, you know, like we have a, a we, we have a, a trans client. So we've been obviously talking to each other um, by, by their chosen pronoun. But then when you're actually doing the transaction, their official documents might say something else. So you have to apologize why you have to, you know, no, just to show the understanding and also in our internal Slack channels, every time we get an LGBTQ customer, there's like, yeah, like little party poppers and stuff. And at some point, I'm just, I'm not shy to show that anymore. And I was saying before you joined us, I mean, like the, um, the Christian, hardcore Christian clients that we also have a fair few of, um, they'll either stay with us or not when we, when we do our thing, you know, we, we don't, we're not aiming to please everyone. We are who we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm also glad that for the most part people are you know just like humanity is pretty good people are pretty good <laughs> um, I think if, you, if you look for that like if you if you honestly believe that the majority of people aren't out to do you harm then you won't see it if you think everyone's out to do you harm then you'll find it so yeah correct yeah maybe it's also my perspective yeah Mm. Okay, that's a yeah, good note to uh, end on for me anyway. All right, so there you have it. Not your typical Japan real estate podcast episode, but a whole lot of fun, or at least it was a lot of fun for us. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku! Yoroshiku!